Welcome and thank you for joining us for the OSS Society's OSO Social Conversation Series. An OSS staffer said General Donovan's imagination was so powerful, he could see an acorn and envision an oak tree. Although today marks the 75th anniversary of the OSS's dissolution, its legacy is being kept alive today by our intelligence and special operations communities at the tip of the spear. The inspiration for the name of this month-long series was drawn from the fact that so many OSS personnel were members of the social register, it was said its initials really stood for oh so social. And for this reason, we're asking everyone tonight not to practice social distancing. Instead, we would like everyone gathered tonight to practice oh so social distancing. Because we could not hold the Donovan Award dinner this year, we wanted to use this virtual format to keep our OSS family together during the pandemic. And we're honored to bring together leading figures from the intelligence and special operations communities to discuss critical national security issues. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Fiserv, Palantir, Incatel, Floor and Periton, and our media sponsor, The Cypher Brief, and our OSO social patrons for their support. And to all of you, including members of the intelligence and special operations communities, the service academies, representatives from the intelligence and armed services committees, and senior government officials, thank you for supporting the OSS Society and for being with us this evening. We have an outstanding panel to kick off the first event in our series, a third Special Operations Forces Revolution. Before this evening's discussion begins, I'd like to spend a few minutes showing you the OSS Society's most ambitious project, building the National Museum of Intelligence and Special Operations. Eventually, these programs such as tonight's will be held in the museum's Oh So Social Club, a bar that will serve as a gathering place for the special operations and intelligence communities, because as a special operator once told me, every operation starts or ends in a bar. And I'd like to show you a brief uh, video about the museum and we welcome your support in making this vision a reality. I used to look at the pictures of the people in the OSS, the guys that were in Detachment 101 or that were the Jed Bergs, were the people that were the foundation of the OSS, our history. And I always used to look at the faces and I looked at the eyes. And what dawned on me was, there's no difference between those people that were doing that as the greatest generation and the people that are doing it now. There's the same commitment, there's the same belief in country, there's the same love of what this nation stands for. Basically look at somebody and say, you need somebody to go, send me, I'm your person. The glorious amateurs from World War II's Office of Strategic Services have become today's quiet professionals of the U.S. intelligence and special operations communities. The National Museum of Intelligence and Special Operations will honor Americans who have served as our nation's first line of defense. It will educate the public about the importance of intelligence and special operations to the preservation of freedom and inspire future generations to serve. It will be a museum unlike any other, immersing visitors in what it takes to answer our nation's call. We have a unique opportunity to pay tribute to the silent warriors who fight in the shadows for us. By the very nature of their work, these silent warriors of the intelligence and special operations communities do their job out of public view. Their actions are vital to protecting our national security. The National Museum of Intelligence and Special Operations will tell their story of sacrifice and dedication and bravery. I ask you to join me in supporting this important effort. America needs this museum. The spearhead points the way forward in the past, the present, and the future. Find out how you can help make this museum a reality and honor those who keep us safe.
I'm honored to introduce noted author and cocktail historian, Philip Green. If you've attended the Donovan Award dinner in past years, you'll recognize Phil as the OSS Society's bartender, where he's presented the evening's cocktails from behind our replica of the bar from the Hotel Ritz in Paris that Ernest Hemingway and Colonel David Bruce liberated in 1944. We could not ask for a better or a better red bartender. He's the author of mm -hmm. The Have and Have Another, a Hemingway cocktail companion, a drinkable feast, a cocktail companion to 1920s Paris, and the Manhattan, the story of the first modern cocktail. When he's not writing books about cocktails, Phil is the trademark counsel for the United States Marine Corps. After presenting a Marine Corps inspired drink at last year's dinner, General Mattis thanked him for glamorizing alcohol. The recipe for tonight's cocktail was sent to you with this evening's meeting link. We hope that you will prepare the evening's cocktail along with Phil. So please join me in welcoming Philip Green. Thank you, Charles. Uh, it's, as always, an honor. Uh, of course, we'd rather be at the Ritz-Carlton, but this is a pretty resourceful uh, um, way to, to approach um, this celebration and uh, leave it to a glorious amateur to figure this out. So I've been asked to, um, to pay tribute to Ernest Hemingway and his exploits in World War II with the OSS in and around Paris. Um, in my opinion, from World War I until the early 1960s, Ernest Hemingway was the most interesting man in the world. You know, don't pay attention to the uh, Dos Equis commercials. Uh, here was a man who fought and was wounded in World War I, received a Medal of Valor from the Italian army. Uh, he, he was hit, injured by an Austrian trench mortar, received 227 pieces of shrapnel and machine gun bullets in his leg but still managed to carry a wounded Italian soldier to safety before passing out. Um, he, he then, a few years later, comes to Paris. He's one of the leading lights of the lost generation, the great artists of Paris of the day. Uh, moves to Key West, does a little bit of rum running, does a lot of fishing um, in the Gulf Stream. He, uh, he, he travels to Africa, becomes an expert on big game hunting. He, he covers the Spanish Civil War at great, uh, great personal risk. Um, you know, witnessing combat and bombardment and what have you. In World War II, uh, not content to sit on the sidelines, he organized a, a, a spying ring, an intelligence gathering ring in Havana, also hunted for German submarines, U-boats off the northern coast of, uh, of Cuba, and then covered the D-Day landings from a landing craft offshore of, of bloody Omaha Beach. Then he ends up in France, in country, uh, attached to an OSS unit as the Allies move closer and closer to liberating Paris. So uh, we, we take you to the small village of Rambouillet, which is just south and west of, uh, of Paris. He's with the OSS. He's engaging with French resistance. Uh, Maquis, uh, gathering intelligence, actually gets into a little bit of combat, which he shouldn't have. And the Army Inspector General wasn't very happy about it. He was brought up on charges, which he was subsequently cleared of. Um, but his, his, the members of the resistance were so respectful of him for all of his military knowledge and intelligence gathering techniques, they called him Mon Capitaine. But they asked him, a man of such expertise, why is it you're, you only attain the rank of captain? And he said, well, I would, be, I would be a colonel or a general if I only learned to read and write. So they didn't know who he was, of course. Um, so August 25th, 1944, you find Ernest Hemingway with Colonel David Bruce of the OSS, and a, and a few other OSS officers and a handful of uh, about 40 or so uh, French resistance fighters, and they're making their way closer and closer to Paris. Now, um, Ike had agreed that the, the French would be the first under General Leclerc to come into France, but Hemingway and his band of brothers were, were right there behind him. Um, now, upon entering Paris, they first went to the Travelers Club and had a champagne cocktail, of course you have to have a champagne toast uh, upon arriving in Paris, but they made the, a beeline right to the uh, to the Paris Ritz, one of his favorite hotels. And he always spoke and wrote glowingly of the Paris Ritz. He once wrote, when I dream of an afterlife in heaven, the action always takes place at the Paris Ritz. It's a fine summer night. I knock back a couple of martinis in the bar. Then there's a wonderful dinner under a flowering chestnut tree in what's called Le Petit Jardin. After a few brandies, I wander up to my room and slip into one of those huge Ritz beds. They are all made of brass. There's a bolster for my head the size of a Graf Zeppelin. 
and four square pillows filled with real goose feathers, two for me and two for my quite heavenly companion. But on that day in August 1944, Hemingway and his OSS companions and, and his band of brothers with the French resistance, they came stomping into the, to the lobby of the Ritz and he was greeted at once by the manager, the imperturbable Oziello, who, who recognizes him and he says, ah, Monsieur Hemingway, welcome back to the Ritz. What can we bring for you this evening? What can we bring for you all? He says, we would like 57 martinis, please. So at this moment, Ernest Hemingway, the most interesting man in the world, had liberated the Paris Ritz. So um, I hope you all have your gin and your vermouth and what garnish of your choice. Why don't we uh, set about making this drink? Uh, now, before you make a cocktail, you always want to have a nice chilled cocktail glass. This has ice in it. You can always put them in the freezer as well. Now, I'm basing this recipe tonight off of a letter he wrote to his friend Bernard Payton in 1947. He said, uh, to make a, a martini, just use an ounce and a quarter of vermouth. So I'm going to make actually two martinis. Oops, I'm pouring the wrong thing. Um, one for me and one for my dad, who is sitting right over there. So his favorite vermouth was Nwali Pratt. So I'm using Nwali Pratt tonight. And I'm using Gordon's gin. This is the stuff you find overseas. It's 94.7 proof. This is the real deal. Um, he loved Gordon's gin. In fact, on the cover of, of um, my Hemingway book, you see him holding a bottle of Gordon's gin. He called it one of the sovereign antiseptics of all time. So in his letter to Bernard Payton, he said, an ounce and three quarters of gin and just enough vermouth to, to cover the bottom of the glass. He loved vermouth. He drank it all the time, but he didn't like a lot of vermouth in his martinis. Um, I'm putting a couple drops of Gary Regan's orange bitters in here. I don't know that Hemingway did, but this is how I like it. Um, he didn't like a lot of vermouth in his martini. Uh, a, a biographer of his once wrote, Malcolm Cowley once wrote that Hemingway was a martini addict during World War II. Uh, he had a canteen on one hip with gin and a canteen on the other hip with vermouth. And he complained to a friend and he said, can you imagine me in wartime wasting an entire canteen on vermouth? You know, low alcohol, stuff like that. But uh, he, he loved drinking vermouth cocktails out on his boat, the Pilar. So you're just going to stir this. Now, Hemingway was fanatical about making his martinis as cold as he possibly could. He made giant ice cubes made, using tennis ball cans as the mold. He froze his Spanish cocktail onions to 15 degrees below zero. So they, they were served as little like ice cubes inside the glass. He loved onions. The frozen onions would help keep the martini colder. And he also froze the glasses. He said it, it was so cold, it sticks to your hands when you drink the martini. Now, as I said, he didn't like a lot of vermouth in his martini. Uh, and he named, if you read the book, Across the River and Into the Trees, he refers to the, to the martini that he was drinking in Venice as the Montgomery Martini, named after the British Field Marshal Bernard Law Montgomery. Um, it has 15 to one, it's a ratio of 15 parts gin to one part vermouth. 15 to one is a pretty strong uh, martini. Well, why did he call it the Montgomery? Because in his view, Montgomery, he didn't have a lot of respect for Montgomery. He was too cautious. And he said that Montgomery required a 15 to one troop advantage before committing troops in the battle. So therefore, his, the Montgomery martini is a 15 to one ratio. This is, this is mine, by the way, and my dad, of course. And last year, you all were kind enough when my dad came to the OSS dinner. Uh, I recognized him in the crowd. He's 94 years old, World War II veteran himself. And um, you all were kind enough to give him a standing ovation. So thank you again for that. So um, as I'm getting ready to pour these, a couple of favorite quotes of mine. Dol Dorothy Parker, I like to drink a martini, two at the very most. Three, I'm under the table. Four, I'm under the host. And another great quote from George Burns. Happiness is a dry martini and a good woman. Or a bad woman. So to kick off this evening's presentation, 
I present for you the Hemingway Martini, uh, and I end with a final favorite quote of mine from Hemingway, always do sober what you said you do drunk, that will teach you to keep your mouth shut. So at this point, I'll, I'll shut my mouth, but only open it to take a sip. So cheers, everyone. Cheers to the OSS. Thank you, Phil. It's uh, now my honor to introduce Dr. Michael Vickers, who will be our moderator this evening. Dr. Vickers' career as a special operator, a CIA operations officer, national security policymaker, and intelligence community leader has spanned the last two decades of the Cold War through a decade and a half of our war with Al-Qaeda, its allies, and offshoots, service that saw unprecedented senior tenure across Republican and Democratic administrations. Most recently, Dr. Vickers served as the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence, exercising authority, direction, and control of the National Security Agency, Defense Intelligence Agency, National Geospatial Agency, National Reconnaissance Office, Defense Security Service, the intelligence components of the military services and combatant commands. He's received the nation's highest awards in the fields of intelligence and defense, including the Presidential National Security Medal and the OSS Society's William J. Donovan Award. He holds a PhD from Johns Hopkins University, an MBA from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, and a BA from the University of Alabama. He's written a memoir that will be published by Knopf Penguin Random House early next year. He currently serves as Executive Vice President at Inquitel, a principal with the Telemus Group, a senior advisor to the Boston Consulting Group, a senior fellow at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, and on several corporate, nonprofit, and government boards. For our purposes, Dr. Vickers meets the criteria for what was described as an ideal OSS candidate, a PhD who can handle himself in a bar fight. So please welcome Dr. Michael Vickers. Thank you, Charles. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the first of our OSO Social Conversations. During this series, we're going to discuss the current state and future of intelligence and special operations, the national security challenges facing the next administration, and the legacy of World War II's Office of Strategic Services, from which CIA and our special operations forces have evolved. CIA and SOF have been at the forefront of the war with Al-Qaeda, its allies, and offshoots, our tip of the spear. This evening, we're going to discuss the need for additional special operations reform, the third special operations revolution in the view of one of our panelists. To discuss and provide context for this topic, we have three retired Army special operations colonels, Dave Maxwell, Mark Mitchell, and Keith Nightingale. Now, neither Dave, Mark, Keith, or I have made it onto the social register, so perhaps our selection standards have been significantly lowered since the OSS. But Dave, Mark, and Keith have each written recently on the special operations reforms of the 1980s and the need for additional reform today. Dave and Mark, both special forces officers, served from the 1980s until this past decade. During our war with Al Qaeda and its allies, Dave commanded a joint special operations task force in the Philippines. For actions in combat in Afghanistan in October 2001, Mark received the Distinguished Service Cross, our nation's second highest award for valor. He later commanded a joint special operations task force in Iraq. And during the Trump administration, after retiring from military service, Mark served as Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations low and Low Intensity Conflict and as Acting Assistant Secretary. A veteran of both Vietnam and Grenada, Keith served from the mid-1960s to the mid-1990s. He commanded infantry, airborne, and ranger units. He was a founding member of the 1st Ranger Battalion and a key planner for our attempt in April 1980 to rescue our hostages in Iran. So let's begin our discussion this evening by reviewing the contributions of the OSS and the evolution of our special operations forces from the end of World War II to the end of the Vietnam War. Let's start with you, Dave. You argue that the creation of the OSS was our first special operations revolution. Why is that? 
Well, I think uh, as we've heard today, I think the significant uh, contribution of the OSS was the synthesis of intelligence and special operations. Uh, you know, we've had, of course, uh, intelligence and special operations type capabilities throughout our history, uh, but it was the OSS that really brought them together. Uh, and in the three years, uh, it really demonstrated that it combined the entire package of unconventional warfare, direct action, you know, theater special operations, uh, or recovery operations, uh, intelligence gathering, uh, intelligence analysis, espionage, uh, morale operations, or psychological warfare, and even civil affairs, as uh, noted in the, the movie The Monument Men. You know, nearly every capability that we have today in the intelligence community and special operations was in the OSS for those three years. Uh, but one of the most important contributions that the OSS made was in assessment and selection. Uh, there's a famous book that you know, currently costs many hundreds of dollars out of print, uh, assessment of men and how selection uh, for the OSS uh, took place. What's really interesting is that those processes that were established by the OSS form the foundation for our current day assessment and selection uh, uh, programs and uh, for the intelligence community and special operations. Now, as we, of course, uh, sadly, Truman disbanded the, uh, the OSS. Uh, in 1947, the CIA was established. Uh, and then the Korean War broke out, and uh, the CIA fought valiantly there, uh, contributing uh, intelligence, but uh, we didn't have a special operations capability. It was really ad hoc, and uh, brave men and women uh, conducted partisan operations in Korea, uh, but it was hampered by a lack of an established uh, organization uh, that would be resting on you know, a solid foundation of training. But like all OSS and, and soft personnel, you know, they persevered, adapted, uh, and, and did the best they could. And the lessons they learned shaped the future. Of course, SF was established in 1952 uh, out of the Psychological Warfare Office in the Army, uh, General McClure. And of course, Aaron Bank and Russell Volkman were the two leading uh, thinkers uh, in the development. And of course, Aaron Bank's OSS experience, Russell Volkman's experience fighting guerrillas in, as guerrillas in the Philippines, they developed the organization and the doctrine. Uh, our focus, of course, was on unconventional warfare and resistance in Europe, uh, resistance to possible Soviet occupation uh, if the communists uh, did attack. And we benefited from the Lodge Act, uh, which allowed a large number of uh, immigrants with languages as well as combat experience from World War II. Uh, and by the end of the 1950s, we were already advising and assisting in, in Vietnam. And in fact, uh, the first casualty in Vietnam, Captain Harry Kramer commanded the first, first 14th Special Forces Detachment was killed on October 21st, 1957. Later, uh, Captain Roger Donlan was the first recipient of the Medal of Honor, uh, commanding ODA 726 uh, in July 6, 1964. Now, Kennedy, John F. Kennedy, saw the value of SOF uh, and not only recognized the Green Berets, but he also established the SEALs uh, and, and really uh, brought uh, uh, special operations to the forefront. You know, he understood what he called the new kind of war that was ancient in its origins, the guerrilla warfare, subversion, sabotage, uh, insurgency, uh, and really the essence of political warfare uh, that George Cannon described so well in 1948 in his policy planning memo. Um, we developed incredible capabilities in Vietnam and Southeast Asia, Laos, Thailand, uh, partnering with the CIA for the Civilian Irregular Defense Group uh, program, White Star in Laos, Mac Visog, and 5th Special Forces Group throughout uh, Vietnam. And, and we did everything from high-end rescue capabilities uh, at Sante uh, to intelligence gathering and across border uh, to support uh, uh, the conventional forces. But of course, post-Vietnam, we suffered from a lack of an established joint organization, as well as the lack of a high-level patron. Uh, and the size of SOF declined uh, in the aftermath. So. I would say that uh, you know the importance of the three decades in the Cold War uh, is that we needed a joint soft organization and we needed a high level patron. Uh, but soft did, you know, what we learned was soft had, had great value in contributing across the spectrum of conflict. And I think it set the ground for what I would like to call the, the two soft trinities, uh, which are irregular warfare, unconventional warfare, and support to political warfare. And the second is the comparative advantage of special operations, which is governance, influence and support to indigenous forces and populations. But this all rests on the soft capability, the complementary soft capability of the exquisite special operations uh, capabilities required for the no-fail mission of counterterrorism and counterproliferation. So I'll stop there. 
So Keith or Mark, uh, would you like to uh, add anything on uh, the soft legacy from OSS to the end of Vietnam? Keith, why don't we start with you? I don't want to add anything on to uh, to Dave's uh, excellent explanation. He's he's one of our uh, most uh, talented historians when it comes to this. All right. Well, I'll get you on more current decades. Yeah, I, I okay, think Keith, uh, what Dave ahead, outlined Keith. is very important in terms of building the skill sets in that particular form of warfare, if you would, that gave the senior leadership more in their toolbox. Uh, in other words, something from just pure conventional approach to a mix of great capabilities that actually in some situations had much more influence over the outcome than the conventional. Uh, is extremely important development, I think. All right, let's turn to our next segment. Um, Keith, you were a founding member of the 1st Ranger Battalion. Why were the Ranger Battalions reactivated in the 1970s and how have they evolved uh, since their reactivation? Well, uh, you have to understand that in 1973, when we left Vietnam, the Army was basically dead in the water, to use a naval term. Uh, it was bereft with drugs. Uh, racial and social unrest. Uh, there were just huge discipline problems throughout the system. The NCO Corps had been decimated by the war. The officers didn't really know what to do. The Army at that time was essentially incapable of performing its basic missions. General Abrams, the chief of staff, saw that. And he decided that the only way the Army was going to get better is to create an organization that can be an example for the rest of the Army base. And based on what he saw uh, during World War II, he used the Ranger Battalion model. I mean, here is this overweight farmer officer, non airborne, deciding that the he was going to build the army based on a essentially a ranger airborne organization. Uh, and he was very specific in what he wanted the unit to do and how it would do it. Uh, it had to be fenced from all of the social and uh, organizational requirements of the army at that time. It would have complete selection capability. Uh, outside of any other uh, criteria. It could get the best and the brightest within the Army, but it had to develop what would become the core basis of Army training uh, techniques, and it would rebuild the officer and the NCO core. And then based on essentially 12 months of exercise, it would then proliferate its officers and NCOs to the rest of the Army base and teach them how to get better. And it would be an evolutionary process. Uh, this we did beginning in 1974 at Fort Benning. Uh, events began to accumulate that required adjustments uh, the Rangers were viewed as the finest light infantry in the Army. Uh, and that capability then became noticed as a potential, call it gap filler, in the special operations area. As we morphed forward with the Iran rescue as the first iteration, where the Rangers for the first time as the conventional force were integrated with uh, Delta during the Iran rescue to do specific Ranger sort of tasks, primarily security uh, and area uh, management. Uh, this then evolved into a specific major Ranger role post Iran, which was airfield seizure, where the Rangers would become the special ops security force for Delta and the new uh, SEAL Team 6, now DEV group, that was established. 
and this would all be done in concert with the first special operations wing the air force elements this was a brand new introduction of the rangers and their integration into what is now special operations and it was not well regarded by the conventional army base or even a number of the geographical sinks at the time they wanted the army uh, the rangers to be a conventional infantry force and uh, circumstances compelled that the rangers would become an integrated force uh, even in the time that I commanded my battalion, we had essentially two field manuals. One was conventional light infantry and one was special operations. And we had two separate and distinct arms rooms and, uh, and equipment methodologies. Grenada changed the whole program for the Rangers and special operations. Uh, the disaster that unfolded as a result of it, and I was the 82nd as an assault force commander, uh, forced Congress over the service objections to create a really robust joint special operations command. And it forced the services to essentially pony up to the bar and create and support all of these forces that had been generated as a result of world events and become a truly competent force with the creation of U.S. SOCOM as a sync level organization to manage the administration and logistics support for the overall large special ops forces as a result of the uh, desert wars and the other peripheral issues that went on. So how well do you think um, the Rangers fulfilled General Abrams' idea of being a template for, for the revitalization of the Army? Well, I, I think the answer is they did then and they do now. Uh, there is no difference between a Ranger NCO doing conventional ops and one doing special ops direct action in Afghanistan. It's all the discipline and the small unit proficiency at the individual level. It's the sense of dedication and purpose. The only difference are the toys that they play with. Uh, the mentality that allows a ranger to go from special ops to conventional it is all the same. It's exactly the same. You, you give a ranger, you know, task A, he'll do it. You give him task B, he'll do it. It's the same skill set. There really is no difference. Uh, so you mentioned uh, 1st Special Operational Detachment Delta, which was activated in 1977. Why was Delta created? Uh, the world was changing at that time. You go back and it was not nation state fighting against another nation state it was all these non-state belligerents and entities you had the biter meinhof the brigada rosso and a hezbollah and they were not national entities that we were at that time normally used to dealing with how do we deal with these desperate entities and the hostage barrier situation became a major issue at that time, particularly airplane hijacking. Uh, and there was no capability within our force structure to do that. The Army's interim measure was something called blue light, which was essentially special operations guys at Fort Bragg that trained against potential hostage barrier situations. Uh, the Army recognized that there needed to be a more competent, larger capability. And so it created the Delta Force. And this was based entirely against the British SAS model, because that was already in existence. It had been doing excellent work against the IRA and other uh, programs, and it was, it was a good base model. Uh, the Army selected, uh, actually General Meyer did personally, uh, Colonel Charlie Beckwith 
uh, Special Forces to be the first commander because as Meyer told me, he knew that Charlie had the force of personality to bulldoze through all the bureaucracy at uh, Fort Bragg to make this thing work. The point of Delta was to be able to handle these quote, unconventional warfare situations around the world uh, and basically be the U.S. version of 22 SAS. I remember in 1978, I got sent to uh, the SAS for close quarter battle training, and they were way ahead of us then. And within a decade, you know, we, we did quite well and we're teaching them some things. Um, so you, you mentioned uh, Desert One or Operation Eagle Claw, the uh, Iran rescue attempt, which I know you were a key planner for. And major special operations reforms really uh, grew out of that, that failed attempt. So walk us through the creation of the Joint Special Operations Command and new special operations units, such as the uh, Army's 160th Special Operations Regiment uh, and additional units that followed Operation Eagle Claw. Uh, well, you have to understand that during the Iran rescue period, there was no real force capability for this situation other than several desperate units. You had Delta Force, which was still training, not yet operational. You had the Air Force First Special Operations Wing, which was basically the bottom of the Air Force barrel in terms of priority and resourcing. The Navy didn't really have a special operations capability. They had SEALs, but they did SEAL type work. Uh, the evolution of the rescue force uh, made it pretty clear what was needed in terms of a capability. Understanding that when the failure occurred, uh, President Carter directed us to be prepared to go in 10 days for an in extremis extraction yeah. uh, if he felt the hostages were going to be uh, executed. And he then sat General Jones down with us and had what's called a white paper session, which is a blank paper session. Write down everything you need, and as a result of this experience, and we'll figure out how to make it happen. Well, General Meyer was very clear on a number of points. One of them was that we needed a way to get rotary wing aviation to carry Delta to a discrete location, other than these long distance uh, fraught with mechanical issues. That required a lift capability that could be placed on board the EC or the MC-130, which then meant the Little Birds, the uh, o v Vietnam era OH-6 or the newly emerging MH-500. This became the basis for what was Task Force 160. He wanted to give Delta a high degree of confidence in its force lift capability. He also wanted to greatly expand the Ranger special ops capability into airfield seizure and the discrete external defense requirements for Delta. Large in his mind also was the necessity for having credible US eyes, intelligence eyes on a target. Uh, the failure of the CIA to identify specifically where the hostages were was a major shortfall in the actual raid itself. He said, you know, quote, I'm never going to send U.S. Army soldiers again against an objective without credible U.S. intelligence. And that became the birth of what was initially FOG, the Field Operations Group, than ISA. The Task Force 160 organization expanded into not only the OH-6s, the LOCH, which uh, we designed with Bell to fit in a C-130, and the blade folding kits, the Rangers would manage uh, the blade folding kits, roll out the birds, 
put the blades back on, put on the seats. Delta would get on board the birds and they would fly off. Concurrently, there would be a long range penetration capability with the uh, special ops modified Chinooks with the uh, in-flight probes, as well as night vision goggles and a long range tank system on board, plus greatly increased power. Uh, the OH-6s became the Hughes MH-500s with the rotor, the quiet rotors, the instrumentation, the extra power, and a whole series of knock-on, knock-off capabilities, snipers, people, guns, intelligence, fill in the blanks. Uh, the entire aviation brigade of the 3rd Brigade 101st was converted into a special operations program. That was the core of Task Force 160. Uh, and all of this proved itself post Grenada uh, after JSOC had been expanded. JSOC was initially a force created by the Holloway Commission, but did not have anywhere near the staff or requ uh, personnel required to be a true headquarters. We had 32 people from the CG on down, uh, completely incapable as Grenada proved. Uh, the expansion of JSOC into a much more robust force with the addition of uh, not quite assigned forces, if you would, but basically permanent routinely training forces from all services immensely assisted JSOC in what was proven during uh, Just Cause in Panama. Panama uh, basically was the imprimatur of the evolution of the special operations forces from bits and pieces uh, of slightly accepted force capability within the services to a true force in being by itself capable of doing uh, tremendous things, particularly with the creation of U.S. SOCOM after Grenada that allowed a degree of control and management across all of the services that did not exist before. And I would say up to that point, had been strongly resisted by the internal service bureaucracies. Um, so I very much enjoyed your book. Uh, for our audience members, uh, Keith just wrote a book called Phoenix Rising, which he has uh, 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 prominently displayed there, uh, which covers a lot of this history. And it brought back a lot of memories for me. One of them was the aborted attempt after um, uh, in the early 1980s after the failed Iran rescue attempt uh, to create what was called a strategic services command. Um, I remember at the time um, ta talking about this with Bucky Burris, one of the founding members of Delta, about this proposal and their hopes were very high, but then they were stillborn. Uh, briefly tell us what it was and why it uh, failed to gain traction. Well, uh after the Iran rescue, um, the of course, the forces, what was then called Honey Badger, which was the in extremis force that was developed, uh, you know, did uh, it was resourced, it did its exercises, we had all of the uh, potential scenarios worked out. And each of the service component types uh, talked to both General Vaught and General Schultes, the head of JSOC, and to General Meyer, and complained about the problems they had internal to their own services with getting support. For example, First Special Operations Wing Hurlburt, which was a significant part of our force, was at the bottom of the list for Air Force priority. As a result, it had a lot of hangar queens that couldn't get its aircraft operational as a example, and this was replete in all of the services. Uh, and also, the, at that time, the, servant, the geographical operational sinks did not really have a good understanding of what this force could do or how it could benefit them. 
and they were generally resistive uh, because this was kind of an unconventional loose cannon rolling deck kind of organization. Uh, General Meyer, who had a great sense of vision on what needed to be done and how it needed to be done, said, well, what we really need is an overall management capability and a military structure that can pull together all of the service special operations uh, forces and requirements, provide some overarching uh, view of what they need for resourcing, personnel, training, and then organize and fit this force and send it out to a specific geographical sink as required. Uh, General Meyer uh, established a, uh, a joint initiative called Strategic Services Command, STRAT, CIRCOM, and that would become this organizational issue. He was very clear it would not be an operational headquarters. It would become an administrative and resourcing headquarters, much like headquarters MAC or a, a similar sink. And uh, he presented this in the tank. Uh, the service chiefs demurred on making a decision and instead asked that a task force be sent out to each of the sinks to get the briefing on strategic services command and then to send a message back to the chairman outlining their feelings about this particular initiative. Well, we went out to all of the service, uh, all of the uh, uh, UCP sinks and gave the briefing and they all came back and said basically, hell no, we don't want it. Uh, it's going to be a organization they were afraid would end up being an independent entity invading their particular ground. Uh, and General Meyer then just clearly saw the writing on the wall. It wasn't going to happen. And so rather than force a vote, he just tabled it. Well, the basis of Strat CIRCOM became what Nunn Cohen understood and built. Uh, they had a number of backdoor briefings on what Strategic Services Command was designed to do, and U.S. SOCOM was an outgrowth of that particular issue. And it wasn't until U.S. SOCOM was established that the services began to support their entities in a truly meaningful and visible way. Yeah, and of course, you know, as you mentioned, Grenada played a real key role. I was a CIA officer by then for the invasion of Grenada, um, uh, but it certainly helped trigger the path, although there was still a lot of resistance. I remember um, the interim step in the Pentagon was a joint special operations agency before we actually got U.S. SOCOM and uh, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations in Low-Intensity Conflict. There were even proposals at the time, I remember in 1985 or 86, for a sixth service. Um, uh, Dan Daniel, a congressman at the time, was calling to make special operations its own separate service. Um, okay, so um, Dave and Mark, uh, you both joined the Army in the 1980s, and like the 1960s and post-9-11 period, the 1980s were another period of major soft expansion going from three active special forces groups to five, for example. Um, Dave, you've described the creation of ASD Solik and SOCOM as the second special operations revolution. Uh, why do you say that? And uh, Mark, welcome your views on the non-Cohen reforms and their strategic impact as well. Well, I think Keith laid out the history brilliantly there. And, uh, and I, what, what I see is that from EOCLA, and you know the failure there uh, through really deep reflection, self-criticism, the Holloway Commission. You know we really uh, recognized and understood the problems that we had with the lack of a, uh, a joint headquarters and a, and a capability to integrate what Keith called all the disparate special operations capabilities. And so uh, that period, really from 1980 to 1987 
uh, was one, and, and Keith described the bureaucratic jujitsu that was taking place. Uh, the services were resistant to, yeah. to that. And it really took Congress uh, to be the force, force and function of, uh, of, you know, to really make a change. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, at the same time, you know, of course, Reagan was, was uh, elected and he, like Kennedy, saw the value of special operations. And so uh, that's why we started increasing, reactivating the first special forces group later yeah. in the decade, the third special forces group. Uh, but I think what's really revolutionary when you look at U.S. SOCOM is that uh, Congress uh, forced the services to accept it. Uh, and, and it's likely they would not have accepted it uh, without congressional uh, legislation. But the revolutionary aspect was, as Keith described, you know, we didn't get to a sixth service. We didn't get to the strategic services or uh, STRATCOM, uh, but we gave SOCOM service-like authorities. Uh, we gave it its own funding. It was the only combatant command, and to this day, I believe the only combatant command that has its own major force uh, program funding line, MFP-11. And it had authorities for research and development, uh, which of course, over the years, has really paid off for the rest of the services. Uh, because like the Ranger Battalions uh, that, that Keith described giving back to the Army, uh, the Joint uh, uh, Special Operations Force and its R&D capabilities have developed many uh, pieces of equipment that have proliferated throughout the services, as well as doctrine uh, and concepts. I mean, through, with, and by, you know, Mark Boyette uh, coined that term in 1995, you know, to describe special forces operations. Uh, General Odierno used that in his guidance to the force in Iraq, that we are going to operate through, with, and by the Iraqi forces. So all of that proliferated uh, from uh, the development of U.S. SOCOM. And it really, it was revolutionary because it's a one-of-a-kind command with revolutionary authorities. Uh, and it really put us on the path to develop uh, the special operations force that we have today. And so born out of the the, uh, the uh, fire in the desert, you know, through self-reflection, self-criticism uh, and, uh, uh, and congressional action uh, and leadership by, uh, you know, John O'Marsh and, and, uh, and some real key, uh, key personnel uh, was born US SOCOM. And I think that's the second uh, soft revolution in my opinion. All right, Mark, let's turn to the heyday of soft then, the post 9-11 period. So like the wars in Vietnam, El Salvador, uh, before it, the war in Afghanistan is one of soft's three signature conflicts. Initially, DOD's leadership proposed limited airstrikes and a conventional invasion of Afghanistan as the military response to the 9-11 attacks. After President Bush rejected these options, U.S. Central Command came up with a plan that had SOF in the forefront, partnered with CIA. Mark, you played a key role in the October 2001 invasion of Afghanistan. Walk us through your role there and the operational partnership among CIA, SOF, and supporting conventional forces in toppling the Taliban and eliminating Al-Qaeda's sanctuary in Afghanistan. Thanks. Uh, great question. Uh, before I touch on that, I just want to uh, step back a moment and comment on you know a, a common theme that we see throughout the history of special operations. Keith hit on a bunch, and I think Dave did too. There are several common themes. Uh, first of all, the necessity of civilian leadership, particularly from Congress, but also from some visionary leaders in the Pentagon for advancing uh, the interests of the special operations community and enterprise. Uh, the second one is what I I only jokingly, half jokingly call the class of, clash of civilizations between the army culture uh, and you know the, the standard DOD conventional culture in, in all the services and the um, special operations um, culture, uh, which is you know more uh, attuned to taking risks for a strategic gain. And the last piece is that um, operational versus administrative tension that we saw even before SOCOM was created and it has continued to the present day and in discussions of what role SOCOM should play. Um, so back to your question on Afghanistan. So I was privileged to go in on the night of um, the 1st of November of 2001. Our, our infill had been delayed multiple nights um, due to um, weather conditions. Uh, our MH-47s, uh, the 160th, despite their extraordinary capabilities in some of those conditions, just couldn't make it over the uh, 
the mountaintops with the loads that we had on. Uh, but we did make it in, uh, I think, on our fourth try and uh, managed to link up uh, with our CIA Team Alpha. ODA 595 had preceded us by about 10 days and uh, Abdul Rashid Dostum, the uh, leader of the Uzbek faction of the, of the Northern Alliance and really the de facto leader of the Northern Alliance there. Uh, he, you know, had a great partnership with Mohammed Atta and uh, Haji Moakek of the Hazaras. And we, uh, with our CIA partners, were able to bring in arms, ammunition, supplies, help them plan a um, the thrust towards Mazari Sharif and ultimately the liberation of Mazari Sharif um, and its elimination as a AQ um, sanctuary, which was the first and it was the first major city to fall in Afghanistan. And you know between that uh, about the 11th of November and the end, you know the first week of December, all the rest of the major cities fell like dominoes. Um, made it look very easy from the outside, uh, but I will tell you, it was a very close run affair, and uh, at any moment, uh, it could have turned back on us. And, you know, I was there at the uh, fortress at Kalai Jangi, where our CIA colleague Mike Spann uh, was killed, uh, the first American casualty in Afghanistan, and then um, we captured Johnny Walker Lynn, the American Taliban there. And I've said this many times before, looking back on that, I think it was a deliberate plan to retake Mazari Sharif. And had they succeeded, um, I'm not sure that we would have, that our strategic plan would have recovered and that the rest of the um, campaign would have gone nearly as well. Uh, there was a lot of, a lot of the Taliban who had their fingers in the wind. And General Dostum was very active and telling them, hey, you're going to lose. And if they had sensed the wind turning, probably would have flipped back to the other side. So anyway, it was a, um, a tremendous honor to be there and partake in it. A um, lot of lessons learned. And, uh, you know, we, I think it vindicated the decision to create U.S. SOCOM. Uh, in 1987 and ASD Solik. Despite our shortcomings, um, I'm not sure, I don't think it would have been possible without that organization. So in the early years after 9-11, there was a proposal to make SOCOM a supported combatant command for the global war with Al-Qaeda, much as uh, the Counterterrorism Center is the global lead for CIA CT operations. But the idea was rejected. Uh, do you think that was the right decision, Mark? I do, I do. Um, I, you know, just to give you an example. So I was, uh, I was a young lieutenant in the first uh, Gulf War, and was a brigade headquarters XO after deploying. And as we were getting ready to start the uh, invasion and cross the LD, the brigade XO came to me. And he said, "Hey, Mitch, I need hand grenades and laws, and I need a whole bunch of them." And I said, "You can't have them, sir." And he looked at me and he said, why? I said, because, sir, you're the brigade XO. Your job is to, you know, assist the brigade commander. And if you're at the point where you're lobbing hand grenades and firing laws, we've already lost the battle. And it goes back to this original tent, the tension that Keith mentioned between operational and administrative headquarters. And, you know, no SOP operator worth his or her salt wants to be an admin guy. But we need somebody to do that. And it can't always be involved in the fight. And so, and, and again, it, it gets in a larger issue of the, the, the structure of DOD coming out of 1947 and, and our geographic focus, vice a functional focus. And I think it would have been um, a, a much bigger distraction than anybody has imagined for SOCOM. And so, all things considered, I think it was the right thing to do to keep them out of the tactical fight and allow them to focus on the the uh, holistic soft enterprise and managing that and ensuring that we provide the best trained, best equipped uh, special operations forces to the combatant commanders. 
Well, it's worked really well for CIA. So I, and it's a, uh, Keith, Mark, do you, uh, you agree, uh, Keith and uh, Dave, do you agree with Mark? Uh, I had a, uh, just chime in on what Dave mentioned, uh, two points. One is uh, MFP 11. Uh, you know, that's kind of lost in the uh, ether now, but I can't tell you how important the inclusion of MFP-11, which was the special operations funding line for uh, U.S. SOCOM, was hugely important. And it was a direct result of the conventional services inability, lack of desire to support crucial soft assets. Specifically in the Air Force, the Air Force would not procure new MCAC-130 airframes, despite their promises to Senator Nunn to do that. They consistently stuffed that. The Navy would not support the underwater swimmer, pro, uh, underwater delivery program from submarines or the brown water Navy. Both of these points and issues were brought to Congress repetitive times, and that's why MFP 11 was grown, simply to allow SYNC SOCOM to fund what was essential for his particular service requirements. Mm -hmm. Concurrently, the SYNC service issue was a direct result of the, of the collective services intransigence towards a uh, resourcing and building up special ops forces, a long history, you know, two years plus of reports that they, the services wouldn't fund this, they wouldn't do that, they killed that, blah, blah, blah. And the only way that Congress saw as the solution was we'll, we'll pour all, pull all of these forces out, create an independent service so they can really do what needs to be done. Uh, they knew that General Wickham had attempted to disestablish Task Force 160 and ISA and to reconventionalize, if you would, the Rangers. And only Jack Marsh, was, with his intervention at wearing his ASD Solik hat, had killed that. Uh, in a sense, Congress's use of Nunn, Cohen, and the Goldwater Nichols was a compromise from creating a sixth service. Uh, but that's an indication of the color and condition of the dichotomy between the special ops forces that were required and needed and how the conventional leadership and all the services <clears throat> used that particular capability. Dave, anything you want to add? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, during the GWAT period, and, and Keith makes a great point, which I think we'll probably talk about in the next uh, segment, but, uh, you know, during the GWAT, there was more than Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, the entire special operations community was committed to Iraq and Afghanistan. And I think, uh, you know, like the entire military was. However, I think it's important to note that when forces were not employed and deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan, they were working their regional areas. Uh, you know, we're in Africa, you know, in Colombia and Latin America and the Philippines and Asia, uh, you know, and, and up to this day, you know, in Europe, countering Russian malign influence. And so uh, a huge commitment of the, the force to those two theaters, uh, major combat theaters, but uh, they were employed around the world, supporting the GCCs and country teams, uh, the U.S. embassies around the world. The other thing that I think is important is that we tried to grow soft during this period. The 2006 Quadrennial Defense Review directed some major growth in SOF, and we were able to grow the force significantly. Uh, Special Operations Aviation uh, added a fourth battalion. Uh, we added three companies to the Ranger Regiment. Uh, we grew uh, an entire Civil Affairs Brigade from one battalion, an additional Psychological Operations Group, uh, fielded the CV-22 and other non-standard aircraft, and we grew the SEALs. Uh, the one thing that we, uh, and of course we also grew critical enabling capabilities, intelligence, communications, and logistics. But what we were not able to grow was special forces. Uh, we were supposed to add a complete fourth battalion to each active duty group, which would have increased 
the number of 18s from the authorization at 9-11 of 270 up to 360. And we could not do it. We could not grow the force. Uh, and I think that's, uh, you know, is, is it's understandable that, you know, SOF can only grow to a certain size. You know, we recruit, uh, assess, and train. Uh, now, we did grow fourth battalions, uh, but because we couldn't grow to the size, we reorganized those battalions into and modeled after the Jedburgs. And so there's a historical linkage back from the OSS and the Jeds in World War II to the current fourth battalions in all the special forces group. So I think that's uh, that's something to, to uh, keep in mind. Uh, I just want to add one more point. What what Keith and uh, and and Mark have described so eloquently. The essence of special operations is really about you know creativity and solving complex political military problems. And I think what we saw from from Eagle Claw, you know, through that period, even without a uh, without a, um, a, a special operations headquarters orchestrating everything, people in the community rose to the occasion. And they, you know, the critical thinking, the adaptive capabilities, you know, problem solving capabilities uh, were really uh, manifest in that period. And despite all the problems and challenges that we had, in fact, you know, Keith, Keith's book, you know, which I highly recommend, I wished I'd read it as a young staff officer. Uh, you know, this is about planning. And, you know, to all those at the Naval Academy in West Point that are watching, this is a book. You know, we often read about tactical combat operations and, and all the, uh, you know, the, the heroes of the war. But I'll tell you, we spend most of our time on staffs in the military. Uh, and this is a, a testament how the Pentagon worked in 1979 and 1980. Uh, and there are lessons in this book for staff officers to this day. So I highly commend uh, this book to, uh, to everyone to, uh, to read. Hey Mike, I, I just have one, one, hold another one. Um, one quick, so one quick add-on. Topic about the need for uh, additional special operations reform. Um, so let me first start with the question, um, and let me start with uh, uh, Dave and Mark, and then go to Keith. Um, when do you think the so-called second special operations revolution, the ASD, SOLIC, and SOCOM reforms of the 1980s, have been most effective? And when have they not been and why? Mark, let me start with you. So I, I think going back to the comments that Keith made about MFP 11 and that Dave made about the expansion of the special operations community, that is where those reforms have been the, you know, without a, I don't think without any doubt, the most effective. SOCOM's budget uh, went from about 2 billion in 2001 uh, to over 13 billion a year now, personnel doubled from you know went more than doubled from 36,000 to 75,000, and the management of that kind of uh, organizational growth is, is a full-time job. And this goes back to my previous answer of why the difference between SOCOM and CIA CTC is that CIA CTC is not growing. Um, not responsible for creating all of the forces that it's going to, you know, they're going to be employed globally. Um, and they, I think that SOCOM, uh, with all due respect to all of my colleagues and friends down there, when it comes to logistics and force development stuff, they are, well, glorious amateurs. And it's a full-time job for them to to stay focused on this. And this goes you know, back to my previous answer. And again, this is where they've had the most tremendous and positive impact in ensuring that we create the right forces, that they're funded, equipped, that they have the right training. Um, and we can touch a little bit later on authorities, uh, but I think that's been the most um, effective result of those reforms. Dave? Yeah, I think the you know, looking at the period from 1987 to 2001, SOCOM really did uh, embrace its service-like responsibilities for research and development, for organizing, training, and equipping the force. And I think that it really demonstrated uh, the need for having that headquarters uh, that can integrate those capabilities, organize, train, and equip, uh, and I would add optimize. Uh, but, you know, counterintuitively, SOCOM got off track at 9-11. And in those, you know, we went to war and, and SOCOM stepped up, you know, really uh, sent forces to war, prepared forces for war. But from 9-11 to the present, 
It's really been the wars as the 25 meter target. And all of the, the systems and programs that they developed from 1987 to 2001, you know, while they were still in effect, SOCOM hasn't really been able to focus on the long-term development of the force because you know, the war is the priority and they had to support the forces in the war. So they use those service-like uh, authorities to support the war, but I think that uh, we, we lost a lot of focus on the long-term planning and development uh, that, uh, that SOCOM I think was doing very well up till 9-11. And that's why I think we uh, we really need to consider uh, you know a third revolution, which I guess we'll talk about. Keith, anything to add on this topic? I think uh, the forces that were developed uh, did a extraordinary job during the uh, sandbox wars in discrete actions within their task structure, if you would, the direct action stuff. The concern I, I have had then and I still have is that everybody looks upon them as kind of a self-licking ice cream cone and they get spread out all over the world. Everybody wants a piece of them and the people get stretched beyond what is really logical or good for the service itself. Uh, Dave mentioned how many other programs are going on in the world other than uh, the sandboxes. And those are all those discrete, highly qualified, highly selected special ops folks off doing what they're supposed to do. But there's only so many of them. And they get worn out, tired out, they get shot, they get hurt. Uh, it becomes a burden to keep them up to strength doing what they're supposed to be doing. On a larger sense, I'm a little concerned that the headquarters, because of its size and the great desire of everybody to use it, that it becomes just another ponderous bureaucracy and it loses a lot of the operational uh, uh, creativity and uh, turnaround capability that the earlier smaller force was able to accomplish. Now, much of that is the purview of JSOC. And so it's possible that between the necessary administrative bureaucracy and the actual operational agility, that that can be balanced. But it is a concern uh, that I have overall. Okay. Um, Dave, so you've recently argued that Congress needs to establish a military department for special operations with a service secretary and a service chief who's a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Why, why is such a dramatic step necessary? Yeah, this is what I call the third soft revolution. And I think, uh, you know, as we've discussed tonight uh, in the experiences of Keith and, and all of us uh, over time, uh, you know, I think it's really the natural evolution. Uh, but of course, if we did it, it would be revolutionary. Uh, and um, you know, I think that Congress is actually thinking about it, even if they don't say it. And I, I say that because uh, when the National Defense Authorization Act of Section 922 uh, was really an attempt to improve civilian oversight of SOF, you know, Congress recognizes a shortfall in civilian oversight. And so they called for the expansion of uh, ASD SOLA, shifting of uh, personnel billets, uh, which really I don't think has been realized uh, because of the the same kind of bureaucratic jujitsu and infighting that, that takes place. Um, they even inserted ASD Solik in the chain of, of administrative chain of command, from the president to the secretary of defense, to the assistant secretary, to the SOCOM commander. Again, the administrative chain of command, not the operational chain of command. But you know, it's a, it's a truism in the military, you do not insert a staff element into the chain of command. And, and so I think that uh, you know, Congress is trying to improve civilian oversight, but I don't think ASD Solik uh, is resourced and, and properly positioned within the Department of Defense to exercise the real civilian oversight that it needs. Now, two authors recently, uh, Shannon Culbertson and Alice Hunt Friend, uh, took me to task and criticized this proposal. And they made a point and said, and they looked at ASD Solik's and they called you out, uh, Mike, as, as one, as being a very successful ASD Solik. And, and if, but they also admitted, that that was based on personality and competence. And, you know, we were lucky, you know, and unless we can clone you, 
to have multiple uh, future ASD Solex in your image, you know, I think we really have to to uh, to develop the right organizations and most importantly the authorities. Now I'm not I'm not hard over on on a department. Uh, you know, I, I throw that out there to to generate the the thinking. I do believe that the leader of soft, though, whether it's a SOCOM commander or a chief of special operations, it's time to give him a seat at the tank and to be a member of the Joint Chiefs. I mean, after all, we have the National Guard Bureau as a member of the Joint Chiefs. And the contribution that SOF makes, I think, really warrants the, the senior SOF leader having a seat on the Joint Chiefs and give him a statutory responsibility for advising the Secretary of Defense and the President. And that, I believe, will, will help overcome some of the bureaucratic uh, infighting among the services as he, will be, uh, the, he or she will be theoretically an equal. Uh, now, I do believe that there needs to be a service like staff and because most importantly are the authorities. And this has to do with personnel management, uh, promotions, assignments, which to this day are still resident in the services. Uh, and so while the SOCOM commander has influence and, and, uh, and oversight, there's no authority and decision making for personnel management and promotions uh, within within SOF that's totally dependent on the services. And so if you want to properly manage the force, uh, I think that you need service response or service authorities uh, to be able to do that. And so I think we've got to move to the next evolution. It may not be a department uh, or a service, but I think that we've got to continue to evolve. And I think giving SOF service authorities uh, will be revolutionary. Hmm. You know, so one of the, I mean, I guess two counter arguments I'd like you to respond to is, you know, we've recently created a space command and a space force and the uh, service chief for the space force will be a member of the Joint Chiefs, but we didn't create a different military department. We kept it inside the Department of the Air Force to not have excessive overhead. In the area of cyber, which is very, very important, we've created cyber mission forces across the services and a cyber command, um, but not a, um, a cyber, uh, separate cyber force uh, as we have in space. One of the, the second argument would be one of the consequences of the Goldwater Nichols reforms, um, maybe unintended consequences, has been that the involvement of service secretaries and the service chiefs in policy and operations has diminished pretty dramatically. So now the chairman is the principal military advisor um, to the president and the vice chairman is his deputy and the service chief's role in, in overseeing policy and operations has been reduced. Wouldn't that, wouldn't a department of, uh, military department of special operations face um, similar challenges then in terms of policy and operations? Yeah, I think that's, I, I think that is a, a valid argument and a concern uh, without a doubt. Uh, although I think that uh, uh, the importance of special operations uh, and and its uh, you know continuous employment, uh, which will not let up, I think will demand that SOF has a role in policy. Uh, and I think that uh, the other thing is what's really important uh, to go back to the history here. We need a high level patron uh, for SOF to want to do this. Either the president or Congress has got to do that, and then they can design the the authorities. Uh, to be able to do that. And uh, again, SOF has always been a hybrid, a unique organization. Uh, and in fact, I think uh, Cybercom and, and Spacecom have looked to SOCOM as, as models, you know, and and, uh, and I think in the future, uh, it will be interesting to see if they develop kind of some of the same challenges that SOCOM has had over the years. Uh, and so, you know, maybe it's time for SOCOM to advance to another level, uh, which may be a model for others. But I think your point is very valid. Uh, we've got to have a role in policy uh, and uh, uh, in operations, uh, but I also think that uh, the majority of operations are going to be conducted in the geographic combatant commands, in which another part of my proposal is to increase the soft capabilities in the GCCs, raising the commands of the Theater Special Operations Command to three-star levels and, and acting equivalent to the service components under the GCCs uh, and resourcing that command uh, to really uh, to provide the operational headquarters uh, in each of the GCCs. Uh, but on the policy issues, you're exactly right. Uh, and Congress could mandate uh, membership in the NSC for soft 
you know, for a soft department, uh, things like that to uh, to overcome some of those challenges. Well, it's hard it's hard to mandate uh, what the president does with his his own <laughs> staff. It's, it's, true, we, true. we have this thing called separation of powers, but uh, uh, but I, your your point is well taken. I whatever effectiveness I had, I know depended on you know sort of two structural things. One being a member of the NSC's deputies committee, um, where I could influence policy and operations, and then paradoxically. Um, having uh, oversight of all the department's operational capabilities. They created this position, SOLIC and interdependent capabilities. So I had strategic forces, including nuclear weapons, conventional force transformation, wrote the defense planning guidance. That got the attention of the services uh, in a big way. Admiral, my good friend and former colleague, Admiral uh, Eric Olson, used to joke that my title was really soft and lots of other stuff. But... Uh, the other stuff helped out a lot. Okay, Mark, um, you proposed that uh, ASD Solik be elevated to an undersecretary and separated um, from policy. What are the pros and cons of that? So, um, you know, I, I want to uh, start off by saying, you know, Dave's uh, proposal for a new department I, is appealing to me on many levels. But I also think it's a it's a bridge too far at this juncture. Um, uh, in addition to stimulating all of the uh, white blood cells, uh, the leukocytes of the Pentagon and the larger executive branch bureaucracy, um, it it's going to cause tremendous sticker shock on the Hill and in the services for the all that MFP two dollars that that soft gets. Um, that is that is really hidden in the service budgets. Um, everything from construction uh, of basic facilities to uh, uniforms, et cetera, um, C-130 airframes. I, I think when you pull all that out and you create try to create a separate service, um, the price tag will cause folks to choke. Um, I, you know, and with the the current situation, the status quo is simply not acceptable. Um, the truth is the SOCOM commander is only nominally subject to guidance from ASD Solik. And if the SOCOM commander were to have a, a seat on the Joint Chiefs, which I think is, is appropriate, um, ASD Solik would be even further marginalized unless it is moved at least up to the undersecretary level. And what I've seen in my my uh, experience in OSD is that the USDPs tend to bring very um, conventional establishment views on, on foreign policy and more importantly on risk management and mitigation. Um, most recently, at least since the departure of the uh, of Michelle Flournoy, the USDPs that I've uh, had a chance to observe, in my humble rec uh, humble opinion, have been far too deferential to the joint staff and the chairman, uh, which is in turn far too deferential to the combatant commanders. And the net effect of this all is an emascul emasculation of the soft enterprise civilian leadership that we really need to, to shape strategically the soft enterprise for this third revolution. Uh, and so often these unconventional and irregular concepts are simply strangled in the crib. They never get to the E-ring uh, because they're labeled as too risky. And I think um, in this era of great power competition, especially in confronting the Chinese Communist Party's unrestricted warfare, um, our current organization that is optimized for direct action in support of CT and COIN is not going to carry the day. And we need much more imaginative and creative leadership. Um, we cannot simply settle for uh, improvements at the margins at the tactical level. We have to address strategically. And I'll, I'll just end by saying this, you know, there's old saying that, you know, amateurs talk tactics and professionals talk logistics. I think in the in the realm of the soft enterprise, it's more that amateurs talk strategy and professionals talk authorities. And until we get 
our authority straight. Um, no matter what organizations we create, uh, we're going to have some challenges. Okay, we're going to turn to audience questions now, which are being uh, texted to me. Uh, and so one common theme so far is um, uh, the shift um, to great power competition in the national defense strategy of 2018. And what is the role of soft there? Or, or put another way, um, referencing your idea, um, uh, uh, Dave, uh, and, and maybe even yours, Marks, um, is it 20 years too late? You know, has that train left the station, that heyday of soft when those reforms might have been necessary after 9-11 for the period that uh, we're looking at now? Um, and so some questions about great power competition or what, what is the role of soft there? Should it emphasize more non-kinetic things in gray zone, uh, whether information influence as well as other um, forms of influence, uh, et cetera. Um, so let's start with that. Um, Mark, let's start with you. So I, I, a couple quick things. Uh, competition is not the same as deterrence. Deterrence is what an adversary thinks about our capabilities, will, and intent. Competition is what a third party thinks of our relative capabilities, will, and intent in all domains uh, of national power, diplomatic, informational, economic, military. And to, to the degree that the Department of Defense conflates competition simply with deterrence and simply focused on the South China Sea, we're missing the boat. Special operations forces um, should be engaged globally and every day um, conducting that irregular warfare um, in a variety of means, particularly through the influence operations and supporting that long-term competition. Um, and to the extent that we're, um, we're focused on just keeping our, our structure for DA uh, in support of CT and COIN, uh, we are gonna miss the boat. It's not too late, but we really do need to create um, some organizations within SOCOM that are going to experiment with new capabilities, new concepts of operation, new personnel, and new skill sets. And I think we need a Lodge Act for the 21st century, bring in more first and second generation Americans with native language and cultural skills um, to address the global nature of this. We need women in SOC too. Keith, what are your thoughts? I'm just uh, keying on Mark. Special operations for peer-peer uh, competition, whatever you call it, they are a tool in the box. They are not the tool in the box. Uh, the key is that the responsible senior personalities need to understand what the capabilities are within the soft community and then build on them. They're not a be-all, stand-all. Uh, they are part of the larger strategy that a theater may have. Crucial to that for the special ops types is experience. They have to understand, feel, smell the culture, the people, the nuances of the societies that they have to deal with. Yes, they can do direct action mission and take out a commissar, but that's only a small part of what their greater value may be. You talk to cyber warfare, psychological warfare, indigenous development, all of those are part of the larger strategic picture that a competent theater commander has to put together for a strategy to deal with the foe and the conditions that he's got at that moment in time. Dave? So uh, you said, you know, the, 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 the ship has already sailed or the trains left the station. We're 20 years too late. You know, there is a Chinese saying that when is the best time to plant a tree? And it is 20 years ago. But when is the second best time right now? And, uh, you know, I think uh, we've got to make those changes that Mark and, uh, and Keith are talking about. The, the problem with great power competition is that I think we tend to equate that with state on state warfare. Uh, and really, I believe that great power competition the competition itself really equals political warfare. 
that's what's taking place. And our adversaries, you know, they turn Clausewitz on its head. You know, we think that war is a continuation of politics by other means, but for our adversaries, politics is a continuation of war by other means. And that's just a subtle word change, but I think it's very important. So I think political warfare is the most likely form that we're going to face in this competition. State on state warfare is less likely, but of course is the most dangerous. Uh, and so we've got to learn how to operate uh, in this environment. And I think when we really look at the problem is we face threats from political warfare uh, strategies that are supported by hybrid military approaches. Uh, and so to deal with that, we've got to learn to lead with influence. We've got to learn to counter and conduct our own political warfare campaigns. And of course, we need the cultural and organizational change uh, that, uh, that I think we've been talking about and particularly what Mark has Mark uh, just mentioned. And you know, I would just add that there are lessons from the OSS, uh, both positive and negative, uh, that I think can be employ uh, exploited. Uh, so you mentioned the OSS. Uh, in the 2008 presidential campaign, uh, the late Senator John McCain uh, floated a proposal about recreating the OSS, which meant in his terms, combining CIA and essentially uh, our special operations forces. I'll confess when I was uh, Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, I thought that maybe we should have a uh, USDISO to try to solve Mark's problem of uh, elevating soft to an undersecretary and getting the synergies with intelligence and taking advantage of the seats that we had on the deputies committee. So I'd like you all to comment on uh, the nexus between particularly in this world of great power competition, uh, various proposals for combining intelligence with special operations or recreating an OSS. Mark, why don't we start with you? So, uh, so I, I think the time has come to reconsider, you know, to to actually consider something, uh, some more radical changes. As as Dave mentioned, our adversaries are taking a a very broad based approach to conflict, whereas in the Department of Defense right now, it's still this kind of binary: we're at war, we're not at war. And uh, if you read Unrestricted Warfare, which I think the Chinese are are you know implementing today it's a very um broad-based uh approach to displacing the united states and what, what the structure that we have that was created in 1947 um i'm not sure that it's the right structure in the 21st century in our interconnected global world and it's time for some uh, i think uh creative and, and and radical approaches um, if we really are serious about addressing this threat holistically. Keith? Uh, somehow we need to be able to mix for the conditions of the world today, JSOC and clandestine operations directorate. The problem is uh, Title 10. Uh, we absolutely need to be able to mix the two capabilities, operational intelligence, the civilian agency authorities with the capabilities that a JSOC brings. Legally, that's not possible now with few exceptions. That needs to be developed because the military mindset is, hey, we do this, those guys do that. Well, the, the truth is, we kind of do this stuff together or we better. Uh, and we're not there statutorily. That needs to be worked on, but it is absolutely essential. Dave? Yeah, I think that's, that's a critical capability, uh, but I, I want to step higher. You know, we're talking about statecraft here. Uh, and I think intelligence and special operations, of course, my bias is I would love to see an OSS recreated. You know, that's my, you know, in my heart of hearts, uh, but I, I would really like to see the ideas and concepts of the OSS really expanded beyond the intelligence uh, and special operations community, uh, because this is State Department and it's Treasury. Uh, you really have to have a whole of government, whole of society. Uh, you know, as Mark said, if you read Unrestricted Warfare or China's three warfares of psychological warfare, legal warfare, media warfare, public opinion warfare, you know, you look at, uh, you know, Russians' uh, new generation warfare, you look at what Iran and, and uh, uh, the Cuds Force does. You know, all of these, uh, you know, of course, cyber plays such a big role. And all of these 
the actions are taking place short of the threshold of conflict. And so it's in the political realm. And so we've got to be able to orchestrate all our instruments of power. Uh, and it takes, you know, as, as we wrote a couple of years ago, an American way of political warfare. Uh, we go back to George Kennan in 1948, his policy planning memo. He really laid it out. Uh, and in fact, I think the Chinese, the Russians in particular, are following George Kennan's uh, 1948 memo. And I think we would do well to relook that uh, and, uh, and, and develop our own uh, political warfare capability, an American way of political warfare, uh, and integrate all of these capabilities uh, and not be caught short or be myopically focused uh, on the binary approach that uh, Mark just uh, discussed, because I think that does a great disservice. We've got to be able to compete in this political warfare environment that I think exists in the 21st century. You know, perhaps our most um, central strategic competition with China over the long run is really in emerging technologies and their impact on wealth and power. Uh, you know, both uh, size and dominance of econ economies in the international system and then how it translates into military and other forms of national security power. Um, central to that is really artificial intelligence and machine learning, quantum technologies, biotechnologies, um, which raise a lot of issues of super soldiers, et cetera. What do you think the impact of those emerging technologies uh, will be on special operations forces? Anybody want to tackle that? Dave? Yeah, sure. I, you know, I, think, uh, I think those really, uh, really will impact, have a significant impact. I mean, biometrics, uh, you know, the amount of data. I mean, it's really, I, I've heard somebody say that who controls the data wins. Uh, and the amount of data that's out there uh, is really critical. And of course, uh, we, have, we ourselves have lost a lot of data, uh, you know, to Chinese hacking and, and things like that. And they're, they're using that. Now, biometrics, I mean, they're, you know, it's going to be very difficult. I, I feel sorry for the clandestine service officers who have to operate in the future because uh, it's really going to be difficult with advanced biometrics uh, that, that to be able to conduct uh, covert operations, uh, you know, without detection. I mean, we, and I hope that we have companies that are developing uh, capabilities to overcome those, uh, those techniques. Uh, but, you know, the other aspect is uh, I had a student tell me that Chinese research and development is called steel to leap ahead. And I think that the the economic espionage uh, that's taking place, you know, stealing our ideas, stealing our intellectual property uh, is something that we uh, we have to, to defend against. And, you know, I think as a nation, we're really not organized to defend our intellectual property, defend our our uh, industry and businesses and capabilities. Uh, it's not uh, it's not something that we do. Yet China in itself conducts economic espionage and economic uh, warfare uh, as a government. A sponsored program, and but we don't have a, a, a government counter to that, and so I think these are the real challenges that we have in the future. Anybody else want to jump in, Mark? Yeah, so I was going to say real briefly, going back to my previous comments about the need for an experimental force in SOCOM, and you know when I asked about what are you guys doing, what is SOCOM doing in terms of experimentation? The answer was always, well, we're participating in the service experiments, but the service experiments are all oriented on high-end conflict. SOCOM needs its own dedicated experimental force to bring it to, you know, do we have the right soldiers? Do we have, you know, the soldiers with the right skills? Do we need an AI or ML, MOS? Um, and what can we do both defensively and offensively and strategically and tactically. And I think this is where that, that experimentation really comes in uh, to focus on, you know, bringing the right folks together. It's going to cause a revolution in warfare. It's already caused a revolution in intelligence. And uh, if we don't uh, actively work to uh, integrate these capabilities into our force structure and concepts of employment, we're really uh, at a disadvantage. You know, you mentioned uh, a number of our adversaries uh, earlier, uh, Dave, about uh, uh, the Russians and hybrid warfare, uh, et cetera. And they certainly cause trouble for us uh, in, 
in Ukraine, in eastern Ukraine, with uh, uh, their employment of unconventional warfare and then hybrid warfare. Um, but strategically, they've caused even more trouble with uh, information influence operations against our European allies and then against us in our presidential elections, the past one we had and one that's ongoing right now. Do you think we've or underemphasized the role of what used to be called our psychological operations forces, now military information support, and uh, do we need to elevate those uh, capabilities to the strategic level? Absolutely. I think we are so afraid of psychological operations, psychological warfare. Just look at how we have watered down the name from psychological warfare, psychological operations, and now military information support operations, the Japanese soup of miso. You know, and I had a PSYOP officer at Leavenworth tell me uh, a year or so ago that it is easier to get permission to put a Hellfire missile on the forehead of a terrorist than it is to get permission to put an idea between his ears. And so, you know, I think that really illustrates our lack of willingness uh, to invest and to compete in the psychological realm. And so, uh, you know, I think our psychological operations forces are the most underutilized and, and misemployed. And the fact is we've got brilliant people uh, in those in, in those uh, uh, formations. Now we got the Global Engagement Center at, at State uh, and you know one of your successors, uh, uh, Mike Lumpkin have actually started that, uh, but that is still I think at the nascent stages and it still is focused on countering, countering the ideology of violent extremist organizations. It is not taking a proactive approach. Uh, and, and of course, when it really comes down to it, this is a, a, a competition of ideology. You know, closed societies versus open societies. It is those societies that, that want to export their authoritarian rule versus those countries that believe in freedom, individual liberty, liberal democracy, free market economy, rule of law, and human rights. And so uh, that is the competition. Now, I, I hate to say, and, you know, that was similar construct to the Cold War, but conditions have changed from the Cold War, but it's still an ideological fight. And we've got to fight and, and compete in that realm. One of my former CIA colleagues uh, just texted about uh, the difference between authorities and permissions, which is relevant to what you're saying is you can have authorities, but you still need to get permission um, from the relevant decision maker to do something. Well, I think we've run 15 minutes over time. Uh, and so I want to thank you all for participating this evening. I hope it was uh, informative and I'll turn it over to Charles Pink. Well, I want to thank uh, Dr. Mike Vickers and this evening's panelists, David, Colonels David Maxwell, Mark Mitchell, and Keith Nightingale for what one, um, someone in the audience said was just a fantastic discussion. And uh, we could all listen to you talk for another couple hours, frankly. I also want to share a note I got from uh, Dr. Ike Wilson, who is the new president of uh, the Joint Special Operations University. He wrote, my question is really mostly a thank you to those four gentlemen for their lifetime of duty with honor to our country and for a long, terrific historical crash course on SOF as their new joint Special Operations University president. As SOF's university evolves and begins the hard necessary work of rethinking and redesigning itself for SOF's future utilities in our nation's so-called return to great power competition, JSAL would be grateful for any thoughts they may have regarding the topical essentials for SOF education for granting the country the SOF utility it needs for the 2020s through the 2040s. So thank you for joining us this evening. We hope you enjoyed the discussion. We look forward to seeing you next week to continue this conversation about the future of special operations with Admiral Eric Olson. Phil Green will be glamorizing alcohol again next week with a drink <laughs> called the Leatherneck that was created by Colonel Frank Farrell. And you can check the Eventbrite's details page for the drink's recipe. And remember, you'll receive another link to join the next week's meeting 24 hours prior to the event. And I now would like to share with you a beautiful rendering of our planned museum. This is what you'll see when you fly into Dulles Airport, which by the way, was designed by uh, Aero Saarinen, who served in the OSS. So thank all of you for joining us. We'll see you next week. The spearhead points the way forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks everybody. <laughs>